I know Jim, you're here. Uh, we can we can see you uh, in this amazing kind of an starlit night. Uh, uh, our uh, let's welcome our next speaker, Jim, uh, on the stage. Uh, and there is so many things to talk about, Jim. Is I do not know where to start, but first of all, you're a graduate from West Point. Thank you again uh, for for uh, for your uh, service uh, and for the for the things you are doing. You are doing a lot of things in the voluntary world uh, for for the for the veterans. So that's. That's something huge. You want to talk a little bit about some or two or three of your voluntary activities of what you do actively for the veteran community? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so one thing I do actually for the veteran community is um, I actually work for a nonprofit called Snowball Express. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's a Gary Sinise Foundation. And we actually take care of the children of veterans who've actually passed away, um, our warriors. And we hold an event every year in uh, Florida now. Um, and, and we bring together all these children who have lost a mother and a father and have another kid meet someone just like them because it's really hard for, for a child to actually lose a parent in one of the wars. Um, the other thing we do is the company actually Shadow Works. Um, we build unique fabrics to help protect some of our warriors out there uh, from gloves to clothing uh, in order to obviously save lives. So that, that's, that's pretty important for the work we do within Shadow Works. That, that, that's, that's pretty amazing. First of all, I'm so excited to have you on the, on the board is you are an engineer, you are a mathematician, you are a doctor. I, I, there are, there, are there any things? You obviously are in the amateur world of astronomy and astrophysics. So I would say you already are a physicist. Is there anything you have not learned in this in this past couple of decades? Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I do. My wife would tell me I do a lot. I have a lot of hobbies. I'm also a fly fisherman. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So I'm kind of into those things that require a lot of thinking and intellectual power. So yeah, I mean, I, I also snowboard. Um, I ski. So yeah, I, you know, I'm with Jacqueline. I'm a competitor. I don't like to lose. I like to win. So that's that's really cool. No, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty impressive. I Means uh, I understand skiing, I understand uh, snowboarding, but competitive fly fishing that will be pretty interesting. So our CEO Gray Parker, he and he's also an expert fly fly fishing fisherman. So maybe one day you both need to uh, talk and talk and catch up. So I, I know uh, I I want to I want to uh, hand it over to you, uh, but I think uh, we can do we will let's do that. Uh, yeah. We can talk about shadow works also at the end of it about your indestructible uh, fabric and eventually I think I hope your narrative can end over there. So uh, over to you, uh, Jim. Yeah. Light years in making. Yeah. So so the intent of this uh, talk is actually to, to talk about designs by the universe. Yeah. So a little bit about my background. I'm actually in amateur astrophotographer, been doing this now for maybe two years. And I've always been amazed with space in the universe. I remember as a kid, and tells you how old I am, I actually remember Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. So that's kind of how far it goes back. I remember exactly where I was when the Challenger blew up when I was at University of West Point. Um, I'm an electrical engineer, it is my undergrad. I actually have a master's in operations research from Georgia Tech. And then like uh, Javek said, I have a PhD in what's called systems engineering. So I'm really an engineer. Um, am I a designer? Yeah, I mean, I think engineers are designers. What's really interesting is to be, those, those pieces of work you showed at the beginning of your talk by those masters I actually, as an engineer at West Point, had to take a class in art, okay? We're, we were all required to take a class in your art. So I can talk dotism, I can talk about expressionism. It was one of my favorite classes, I actually got an A in that class, so can't complain. And, and, and just to go to show you, as an engineer, I actually did pretty bad in English and history back then. I think I got a C or a D in one of those classes, so. Don't I'm worry, Jim. I'm doing okay. extremely bad in my English right now. Don't worry. You're, you're, you're <laughs> really good. I'm still learning. But I can relate to Jacqueline when she talks about using words precisely. I'm actually married to a Brit. My wife's British. I was an exchange officer for a year in the UK. And it's really the Brits know how to use their words precisely and exactly. So the word good that most Americans describe things that's a weak word. They prefer different levels of good from being, you know, amazing that, you know, to good to whatever. 
but uh, yeah, so so I really I really can connect with Jacqueline when she talks about this. So I would be remiss not to talk about a little bit about ShadowWorks. Um, so I'm the CTO of ShadowWorks, and really the way we design our fabrics is kind of where I get involved with the design. And we actually build fabrics for protection of individuals. And what's unique about our fabrics are they're puncture, cut, fire, breathable fabrics. They do many things as opposed to just one thing. You could go out and buy Kevlar, and Kevlar is good at cut resistance, but it's not very good at puncture and, and, and breathable. And it feels like cardboard. And we build textiles that lay well, and you can actually build products that you can wear, put on your hands, around your body. Uh, you could build a hoodie, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of these fibers are very unique. Some of them were inspired by some NASA programs. Um, but that application was very rigid in nature. And we've taken some of those fibers, redesigned the application of them, the knitting process, how we knit them to create these unique fibers. So enough of that. And I want to get into what the, the main feature of the talk is. And it's about space um, and basically designs from space. OK. So, so as an engineer, I need you to get you in the, in the right frame of mind, because otherwise you will not appreciate what I'm about to describe. And it all has to do with distances and quantities. And as you can see, this is, uh, this is our solar system. There's Earth, okay? And, and some distances and, and those quantities of distances are really pretty mind blowing, if you think about it. So the average American or person would, you know, the distance from the east to the west coast is about 2,900 miles. Matter of fact, about three weeks ago, I traveled to Nebraska. I live in Virginia, and that's about 1,200 miles. It took me a day and a half to get there. I averaged about 70 miles per hour, okay? And that's pretty good. It's still a long day. I didn't go very far, but the distance from, think about this, the distance from Earth to Pluto, depending where Pluto is, on its position in the solar system is anywhere from four to two billion miles away, okay? Think about that. We're talking about billions of miles. Matter of fact, I just recently listened to Eli Musk who talked about traveling to Mars and that journey will take anywhere from six to eight months and that's about 34 to 170 million miles away, okay? And that's six to eight months. And I think the spacecraft will travel anywhere, I'm not sure exactly, anywhere from 18,000 to 38,000 miles per hour. Voyager, which left our solar system, travels about 38,000 miles per hour. Okay, so think about those numbers. And then another piece of this is imagine if the sun was the size of a basketball, okay? and the earth would be the size of a golf ball. And if you placed, and if you separated those two objects about 20 feet away, the next closest star in our solar system to earth is about four light years away, okay? So how far do you think you would have to drive your car and place another basketball on the ground to replicate the distances? Maybe 50 miles? 100 miles? That's pretty far. Well, the answer is actually 798 miles. I'm an engineer. I could round up to 800, but I like 798, okay? So 800 miles away to get to the next star closest to Earth. That's incredible. That's crazy, okay? And four light years is about 24 trillion miles away. Okay, and the last couple pieces of information you need to take away from this slide is what is a light year? Well, it's how far light travels in one year, okay? And that is 5 trillion, 800 billion miles. That's pretty far, okay? So there was a study done in 2016, and it estimated that there's about 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. Wow. Two trillion, that's, that's crazy. 
And most of, you know, most people live on the planet Earth, they live in their little bubble, and they think going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving, which is eight hours away, is pretty far, and that, you know, th this is Earth, and we're just here, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty huge, pretty huge number. And they've estimated that actually the universe is 98 billion light years in diameter. Okay, and that's pretty huge. And at one point in time, our universe is going to shrink. It's going to expand, and then eventually it will shrink back to where it started. Okay. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, again, which is pretty big, has about 200 to 400 billion stars. So that kind of, kind of lays down the foundation, if you think about it. And the last piece, remember, Pluto is pretty far from Earth. And if you put it in light year terms, it's hardly far away. It's 0. 0.0005 light years from Earth, okay, which is small. But going to Pluto would take an extremely long amount of time, okay? Here's our galaxy. This is the Milky Way. This is just a what we think it would look like. The Milky Way is about 100 to 120,000 light years in diameter, okay? And if you look at this circle here, our solar system is just one little pixel in the middle. That's it, just a pixel. That's how small we are. In this, in this galaxy. This outer circle, okay, which is represents 16,000 light years, is the furthest star that you can see with the naked eye on the planet Earth, okay? This other circle, which is around the pixel, okay, now this is really crazy. About 200 years ago, we invented radio Okay, and, and we broadcasted a signal about 200 years ago into space, and that's as far as that radio signal has traveled. It has gone nowhere. Okay, so if we're trying to reach other people in other planets across our galaxy, it's going to take forever to get there. Okay, just think about that. 200 years ago, we invented radio transmissions. And that's as far as they have traveled. Okay, the Milky Way is about 13.2 billion years old. Um, like I said, there's about two to 400 billion stars. And crazy enough, most people don't realize this, there's about 100 billion planets in our own Milky Way. Just think about that for a second, 100 billion planets. Okay, that's pretty, and that's one galaxy. Now remember, there's about, how many trillion galaxies I said? There's two trillion galaxies, all those planets and stars. We're talking, it's like mind blowing to me, okay? So that's the inspiration. Okay, so there's so much more. Um, I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, they went to a dark region in the United States and they saw the Milky Way. Okay, so the, this is the Milky Way belt, okay? You might've seen the moon there. You know, a lot of people look up in the sky and they go, oh, there's the Big Dipper, there's the Little Dipper. But you know, there's much more when you look up and most people don't realize it. They just take the universe for granted, okay? But there are some challenges. I call them challenges because they truly are. It's an engineering problem and, and I view it as a systems engineering problem. So it depends where you live in the United States. There's a lot of light pollution within the United States. These dark spots are what are called dark regions. So if you went to a spot like this, you would definitely see this picture. Here in near uh, Virginia, I'm near uh, a really light polluted area, almost a red. I couldn't even see the belt of the Milky Way. I have enough problem just looking at the Little Dipper. I'll see the Big Dipper. So I live in an area like this, okay? So it's really hard for me to see deep space objects. The other challenge when you're shooting deep space objects is you know, being in focus. Um, you've got clouds that run through. Um, you've got to be on the target properly and track the target. Otherwise, you'll get star trails. And the other piece people seem to forget is the Earth is actually rotating, OK? So I have to take all those things into calculation 
and consideration. Matter of fact, because I live in such a light polluted area, I have to use some special filters, okay? So what, what we use is what I call an optical rig. And like I said, and Jacqueline says, if you're gonna do it, you do it with passion. So I actually have three optical rigs, okay? And the reason I have three optical rigs is they all have a different field of view, okay? For example, the one here, I'm, I'm sorry, this one in the middle, which is called a red cat, isn't very big. It's got a decent field of view all the way to this big guy here, which is about nine and a half inches across. Um, it's got a really narrow field of view, but it sucks up a lot of light and I can see pretty dark deep into space. And again, what I did is here's an old Galileo picture. You know, those were one of the first telescopes. It was a refractor telescope. He did best what he could. The field of view of that telescope was really narrow. So when I'm shooting at night, you know, a, a night is about eight hours in length and I'm trying to track a target because these mounts are special mounts that actually track the rotation of the earth and they stay on a target. And obviously I have a camera that needs to obviously be very sensitive to photons that are coming from space. And then I might be on a target, you know, anywhere from six to eight hours. And if you look at the data down here, you know, that's anywhere from 960 frames on a particular target to 96 frames. And how I determine how long I will expose a frame is depending on how much light pollution I have. And then not only am I collecting data maybe on one night, it might be two or three nights that I collect data. And then you have to post-process that data and that could take another hour or two just to build and develop your first image, okay? So it's a really hard process. It, I view it, like I said, as a systems engineering problem. You have a camera, you've got a filter mechanism here, you've got the main piece of glass. Like Jivik will really appreciate this. It's all about the glass when you're a photographer, right? It's not necessarily the sensor, it's the, it's the glass. But in, in astrophotography, it's not only the glass, it's also the camera. These are cooled cameras um, and basically they're CCD cameras. So we're trying to reduce the amount of noise going into the imager in order to create a good image of the, uh, the deep sky space object. Okay, so let's uh, get into the fun. And obviously as an engineer, mathematician, however you want to say it, it's just a bunch of numbers. It, you know, I, I have to have an equation there, okay? So I don't know if you caught on to that, but the equation is B greater than average, okay? So this is the equation to calculate average. I'm sorry, this is average, B greater than average, okay? So this way to, because you've got to be, if you're just average and trying to take a picture of a deep space object, you will get crap, okay? It will not be a good image. It will be blurry. You'll have a bunch of star trails. Um, I know Jivik, he takes pictures of birds and obviously he does a great job because you could get a lot of blurriness in those images. But I would tell you, this is a step up it's probably, the, the problem is 10 times more difficult, okay? It's not an easy process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start from close in objects to really far objects. And all these images are things we took, my son, uh, he's about 13, 14 years old. So we took this in basically the back of our house in a very light polluted area. Uh, I'm here to tell you, it's not very nice. Um, so we have to be really careful on how we shoot these objects. So this is the moon. This is about, you know, 240,000 miles away. You see it every day, you know, at least almost every day. Um, but you do you truly appreciate the designs of this moon? It is really cool. All these dark spots, all the craters. And these are two different images of the moon because they were used, uh, they were taken with two different rigs. One was the four inch telescope and the other one was that nine and a half inch telescope, okay? So this is the nine and a half inch telescope, more detail. I can see further in. 
but that four inch gives me a better view of the whole moon, okay? And these are really cool. I think they're cool pictures. Okay, so here's, here's the sun, which is really a star. You know, we call it the sun. And this is 63 million miles away. And if you look down here, that's actually Mercury. Okay, so back in November 11th of 2019, Mercury transitioned across the sun. So this image was actually taken during the day. So when you take day pictures of the sun, you, got, you better have some decent filters on the front of your telescope. Otherwise, you're going to burn your camera or even your eyes. And what's really crazy, and most people don't realize this, is the next, next transition will be in 2032. Okay? So a lot of these events that happen in the universe, people just take for granted. But you know, there's a timeline to all of this. But this is, you know, this is a pretty cool picture. Okay, so what's at 64 million light years or million miles away? Well, this is Neowise. Everybody talked about it, it was in the news. This is F3. But I don't think people really truly appreciate the fact that this was only discovered in March 27th of 2020. And this was by what's called by the WISE telescope. It's a wide field infrared surveyor explorer. And it's looking for asteroids and comets in the solar system that could actually crash and basically destroy Earth or make it extinct, right? So I won't cover this. I'll let you do the research and do your time to look this up. But there is a difference between a comet, an asteroid, a meteoroid, a meteor, and a meteorite. A lot of these people, you know, a lot of folks will use these interchangeably, but there's actually a real definition of what they mean. Uh, just real quick, a meteorite is what you find on the ground after that particular meteor entered the atmosphere. Okay, so look those up. Okay, let's get into deep space objects, which is really the fun part of all this. Those aren't my photos at all. That just gives you an idea of there's actually five different types of nebula out there. Okay, some people use the plural nebulous, but the, the plural for more than one nebula is nebulae. Um, there's what's called a planetary nebula. And the reason it was called planetary is when they first observed these back in the 17, 1800s, they actually thought they were planets, but they're not. They finally figured that out. And that's really, when a star dies, it, it basically throws out a lot of gas into the universe. And you get this kind of circular image, almost looks like a planet. The other one is called an emission nebula. And it's basically clouds of high temperature ionized gas. And it's basically emitting out these particular ionized gas particles. Uh, there's a reflection nebula. It's where a star is going to use its light source to kind of light up the, the, the cloud structure that's behind it or near it. And then a dark nebula is basically a shadow. I mean, there's so much cloud matter there of particles that light cannot pass through and you get this background image. And finally, which I think is really cool, is what's left over after a supernova goes off. That's basically a massive star blows up and you get all its gas and particles and it's not necessarily round in nature. It could be just a blog or what have you. And then the other piece here is um, back in the 17, 1800s, you know, these young astronomers looked up into the sky and they started to catalog all these things they could see. And the most famous one is the Messier catalog. There's about 110 um, astronomical objects in his catalog. He was a French astronomer back in 1774. So just think about that, you know, over 400 years ago, almost 400 years ago. Uh, there's also one called NGC and some others out there. So that's how we catalog deep space objects. So let's get into the fun here. Ah, okay. So you might know where uh, you've probably heard of the Seven Sisters or Pleiades, and this is about 444 light years away. This is M45. It's what's called an open star cluster. You can see kind of that nebulosity of bluish gas behind those stars. And these are actually kind of middle-aged stars that are about 100 million years old. 
And this is what's called a reflection nebula. Remember, the light from those stars are reflecting off the gas particles behind those stars or in front. Okay, so this is M45. You, you probably see it all the time. You know where it is in the sky when you see it, but I'm sure you didn't realize there was actually a nebula in its mist. Okay, here's one of my favorites. This one's 650 light years away. Okay, this is sometimes called the Eye of God. Um, it's an NGC, and it's the closest planetary nebula to Earth. Okay, now all these nebulas that we're going to talk about here are actually in the Milky Way. They're out of the Milky Way. These are in the Milky Way. Okay, remember, Milky Way is about 120,000 light years away. This one was discovered back in 1824. In the middle of this, this star right here, what created all those gases to expel from it. And one day, it's not quite there yet, it will become a white dwarf star. Okay, now think about this. The diameter of this nebula is 5.7 light years in diameter across, okay? More so than Pluto. Remember, the distance from Earth to Pluto is 0 0.0005 light years. So this thing is really big. And Jim, these are your photos, correct? Correct. Any any photo that has the uh, the JG watermark is uh, a photo I have taken. Yep. Correct. Okay. This is called the Dumb Melt Nebula, and this is a thousand two hundred light years away. Okay. And this was the very first planetary nebula discovered, not the closest to Earth. And this in the and you probably heard the term red giant star. This was red giant. It basically its outer layer and it has become a white dwarf. Okay. Here's the crazy part. This is still growing, still expanding. It's expanded at a rate of 43,000 miles per hour. Okay. One of these fingers okay, is 37 billion miles long. Okay. Several times longer than you know going from here to Pluto. And then the, the other piece is there's so much mass in one of these columns of material, it's is it would weigh as much as three Earths. Okay. That's how much matter is out there. And again, this has a diameter of almost three light years. Okay. So here's a first one. Everybody's heard about Orion. Matter of fact, I think Orion might be coming up here in the next month or two when it's cold outside. This is a diffused nebula, and it sits here's here's uh, Orion. Okay, the constellation Orion. It sits about right there, so it would be kind of in this position here. And I don't know if you know what this is. This is a star, a very famous star. There was a movie named after it. This is Betelgeuse, okay? And it's in Orion. And what's interesting about Betelgeuse is there's a lot of talk among astronomers that one day that thing's gonna blow up and you're gonna see an explosion in the sky, okay? But back to the Orion Nebula. Again, this there is so much matter in space with this particular nebula. There's over 660 million Earths of material in this nebula. And it's 24 light years in diameter. Just think about 24 light years. This is one of the few nebulas you could actually see in a dark sky area with your naked eye. If you knew where to look, you would see a little bit of cotton. It looks like cotton up there. But if you have a pair of binoculars or a decent telescope, you could pull this thing out and, and really see it. And this is really a really cool nebula. Uh, I think Javik loves this one. This is the Horsehead Nebula and what's called the Flaming Nebula. This is a dark nebula. Again, it's a shadow. There's so much material here, so much gas that light cannot penetrate and it almost looks like a horse head. And that's where it comes from. Down here is the flame nebula, kind of looks like a flame. 
And just being a critic of my own picture here, it's not very good, actually. You can see the, uh, oops, sorry, the star trail. See that star trail? This one has to be reshot. It's not one of my better pictures, I apologize. But again, this is six, year, six light years in diameter for the flame and about 3.5 for the horse head. Okay, so now this picture is actually using the red cat. It has a larger field of view. So you could actually get more than one nebula in this image. Okay, we have, it's basically two nebulas in one, a bonus. It's an emission and a reflection nebula. And it's about 10, year, 10 light years in diameter. The reason this one was called a tadpole nebula, if you look really closely, you can see two tadpoles here, okay? I mean, and, and if you really think about that, how did the universe create that and create these designs? I mean, because these are random events, right? All this, this, these dust particles, all these clouds develop on their own by gravity and solar winds, and we get these really cool pictures. And you just have to wonder, how did it happen? Okay, uh, we're almost done with our nebulas. This one's 2,200 light years away. And this is called the North American and the Pelican Nebula. And let me explain why. If you look at this picture here, or this piece of the image, it almost looks like North America. Okay, this is the Gulf of Mexico. This is Central America. This is the West Coast, Canada, maybe Maine, and here's Florida, et cetera. That's where that comes from. And then over here, let me, let me kind of help you out. Okay, oh, sorry. Here's an eye. There's a beak, a head, and maybe a shoulder. And here's the pelican. I see the pelican. I see the pelican. I mean, is that crazy? How did that happen? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, was there, is there, you know, was, I don't know, was God up there designing this stuff or whoever? How did that happen? I mean, it's crazy. But anyways, okay, so this is the North American and the Pelican Nebula, okay? Ruben, now look, think about this. This one here, the North American one, is a hundred light years across. Think about a hundred light years. It's, it, it, to me, it just, it's mind blowing. This is the most recent one we took. This was taken about uh, a month and a half ago. I was in a much better unlight polluted region. Actually, I was in Nebraska. Um, visiting my parents, and I took my red cat. Um, this is actually a star that blew up, and this is all the gases expanding, okay? And it blew up about almost 10 to 20,000 years ago. Um, and it's 100 light years in diameter, similar to the previous one. But if you look at this one again, okay, let me show you something. This is called the witch's broom. If you look, it looks like a witch's broom from Harry Potter. Okay, that's crazy. If you go over here, this is called the Bat Nebula. It kind of looks like a bat from Halloween. Okay, so we give these things all these unique names, but I love the colors and the structure and the pure beauty of this nebula in space. Okay. Okay. This is really cool. This is called, if you're into animals, this is called the Elephant Trunk Nebula. And this was shot with the nine and a half inch SCT. And this trunk is about 20 light years long. Okay, it's a dark nebula because there's a lot of gas and dust in this region that light cannot penetrate. And these are basically areas where stars are being born, okay? And some of these stars are really young. They're about 100,000 years old. Now, if I go to the next picture, okay, get ready for it, okay? Here's the nebula and there's the elephant trunk. Mm. So that tells you how big this nebula is. This is about 100 light years in diameter and that's where it is. And stars are being born out of this piece of the nebula, okay? This one's kind of cool. This is called the Cocoon Nebula. It's 4,000 light years away. 
It's about 15 light years in diameter. And this is actually, again, a stellar nursery. It's creating stars. But if you look at this nebula really closely, okay, look at the big picture, you'll actually see like a trail of dust yeah. that it's leaving behind. Okay, I didn't create that. The universe created that. And I didn't do any image trickery. But there's actually a path of where that nebula kind of is leaving its dust trail. Yeah. And I find that pretty fascinating. OK, so I don't know if you caught this, but when Javik was talking originally, he had a picture of a universe picture on the, on the top left. And it was actually this piece right here, OK? And this is called the Pillars of Creation. And the reason it's called the pillars of creation is actually stars are being born out of these. Okay. All that matter is colliding and creating stars, and they're basically floating away. But this is also called the Eagle Nebula. Let me help you out. Here's the beak, maybe the head, the wings, right? It's it's supposed to kind of look like an eagle. The other thing that it really fascinates me is one of these pillars is actually nine and a half light years long. Just think about that, nine and a half light years. Longer than from Earth to Pluto times however many, just to get to nine and a half light years. And then uh, I think I had two more after this for the nebula. The reason I have this one up is this is the very first one that uh, Messier saw. It's, that's why it's M1. You can't have nebulas without M1. Come on. This is the Crab Nebula. It's 6,500 light years away. This is actually when a star blew up. It's a supernova remnant nebula. It's not a very good picture. I apologize. It's the best I could do at the time. But when this thing blew up, basically, Chinese astronomers noticed this. And you could still see it during the daytime. That's how much light was expelled when this thing blew. Okay? And it's basically 11 light years in diameter. It's pretty far out. And again, it's expanding at a rate of 930 miles a second. Not an hour, a second. It's moving fast. So I plan to reshoot this with my Celestron nine and a half. I think this was on my four inch, but uh, I hope to get a, a much better picture. So Jim, when you say first astronomical object identified, can you explain that? Yeah, so when Messier was looking and in the space with his refractor telescope, he started to catalog everything in space. So his very first one was M1. And this was the Crab Nebula. So he's got about 120 objects in his first catalog when he was looking into space. And remember, back then, it was really, really difficult. The field of view of his telescope was so narrow yeah. that it was mere chance that you would come up uh, on one of these objects. So yep. it's, it's, it's not the Chinese first object or the Indian first object. Yeah, it is the, well, it could have been for them. Yeah, yeah, it could have been for them, but they didn't catalog it. This is one of the official first catalogs of deep space objects. Yep. Um, OK, the second to the last nebula, this is called the Heart and Soul Nebula. This is one of my favorites. So this is a mosaic picture. And the crazy thing, once again, is I didn't place those two next to each other. That's where they are in space. Okay, when you look into this in the outer space, that's where they reside. Okay, there are 300 light years across from one end to the other. And if you look, one does definitely look like a heart. And this kind of looks like maybe a baby, a soul, or what have you. But this one is one of my favorites. And the last nebula, which is 11,000 light years away, it's called the Bubble Nebula. And I I think this one's just really cool. Okay, it looks like a little bubble. Okay, this is, uh, and down here as well is M52, which is an open star cluster. There's about 200 stars here. And this is an emission nebula, and its diameter is about seven light years. I just like how it looks. So those are nebulas. So let's talk about uh, galaxies. I mean, heck, if, if you're going to go, and look into space, why do we have to stay in our own Milky Way? We need to go beyond 
And is it possible to take an image beyond the Milky Way? Okay, because those, those galaxies are even further, right? And as you know it, you know, there's different types of galaxies as in how they're shaped, okay? And that's kind of what this depicts. So let's look at some galaxies. Okay, this is M31. This is Andromeda. Everybody's heard of Andromeda. If you haven't heard about Andromeda, you've probably heard of the movie, the Andromeda strain, okay? It was that alien virus that attacked the earth. Well, this particular galaxy is two and a half million. We're not talking thousand now, we're talking millions of miles away, light years away, okay? I don't know if you remember uh, Carl Sagan, but he always would say billions and billions of stars, right? Billions and billions. Yeah, right? That, I mean, this is crazy. Okay, so let me put this in perspective because this one's, I really get excited about this one. There's over a trillion stars in this particular Milky Way. And this shot right here was one of our first shots of Andromeda. No color, no depth. You know, we we're just amateurs at the time. Uh, this was our second image of Andromeda. And there's actually three galaxies here. Yes, there are three galaxies in this picture. So you are not alone. This is Andromeda. This is not a star, this is a galaxy. This is M110, and this is a galaxy. This is M32, okay? Just think about it, three galaxies right here. And this was a recent picture I took with the red cat um, back in Nebraska. If you look at the redness in here, that's not trickery. Those are nebulas in that galaxy. Remember how you saw all those nebulas we just went through? Those nebulas reside in our Milky Way. These are just nebulosity events you can see in Andromeda. And Andromeda is a galaxy that you could actually see with the naked eye if you were in the right location where there was not much light pollution. And it resides near Pegasus. It's about right here in the Andromeda constellation. And if you look up, you'll almost see like a cotton ball. You won't see the lanes, we call these lanes, but you'll just see like a little cotton ball. And if you've got a pair of binoculars and you look up, you might actually see it. Again, this one's about twice as big at our, as our galaxy. And funny enough, this galaxy is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way, and it's on a collision course with our Milky Way. It's traveling towards us at 70 miles per second. And one day we will collide. And that's about, they estimate four and a half billion years from now. So I don't think you'll be around, <laughs> um, but you might be if we ever figure out how to, uh, you know, lengthen our life, but who knows? Or we may not even be on this planet. We could be somewhere else, who knows? Okay, the next one is 21 million light years away. Okay, so we've gone up a factor of 10. Okay, we we're at 2.5. Now we're at 21 million light years away. This is M101. It's called the Pinwheel Galaxy. And it's basically what they call a face on spiral galaxy. It's 170 light years in diameter, and again, about a trillion stars. Okay. And this was shot with a nine and a half inch. As you start going further into space, into the universe, longer distances, you need more glass. You got to have a bigger aperture. Um, so I think, uh, don't you have a 14 inch refractor or reflector, right? A reflector, 12 inch. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, okay, the next one is at 23 million light years. This is M51 and what's called NGC 5194. And these two galaxies are actually coming together and gonna collide, okay? So they're on a collision course. Here's one of my favorites. This one's 30 million light years away. Okay, just think about it, 30 million light years away. And what I also like to say, and I didn't do it on Dramata, on Dramata, the light that we just captured to create this image Okay, think about this. Remember, this is 30 million light years away. 
it took 30 million years for that light to travel through space to arrive to planet Earth, to go down my telescope, to hit my CCD imager to take this image. So this light has been traveling a long, long way in time in space. Okay, just think about that. Okay, it's an edge on, it's about similar in diameter to our Milky Way, similar number of stars. It would look very similar to our Milky Way if we were far enough in looking at the Milky Way. Okay, this is called the silver sliver. Try to say that 10 times. <laughs> okay, uh, the Leo triplet, again, further out in space, 35 million light years away. Okay, there are three galaxies here. You can see them. Okay, and they're all kind of being attracted by the gravitational pull because I forgot to mention that every galaxy in the center of a galaxy is a black hole. Every galaxy has a, a, a black hole at its center. And that's what keeps it together. It creates, it, it stops all the chaos from occurring, from matter flying everywhere, stars going anywhere. It's kind of the glue that keeps your galaxy together. It's really important to have a black hole. And we have one, okay? Um, I think the one on the far right, this is called the Hamburger Galaxy. I'm not convinced it's a hamburger. I don't see it, but yeah, that's what that one's called, okay? Okay, here's one. This is what's called the Markarian Chain. This is 54 million light years away, okay? 54. This is really crazy. I love this picture. And I'm here to convince you to love it too. There's actually 13 galaxies here, okay? And I'll point them out to you. And it's called a chain because there's a loop right here. Here's a galaxy, here's a galaxy, here's a galaxy, there's two galaxies, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. And there's actually a galaxy over there. Look at all these galaxies. And just remember about it, there's a trillion galaxies out there. There's billions of planets in each of these galaxies. So, I mean, if we're the only people in the universe, man, what a waste of space. My <laughs> word, holy Toledo. But what's unique about this, and I had no idea at the time when we took this picture, is M87 is actually pretty famous, okay? M87 is the first galaxy that has the black hole in the center that we were able to take a picture of the black hole from planet Earth using radio telescopes. And I wanna say this was about two or three years ago. There's a lot of buzz out there in the scientific community, but this picture is not my picture, but this is the picture of the black hole that resides in the middle of M87. It's I, right I, I, remember, I remember that, Jim, there was a lots of buzz about the Arcadian disk and how to really get a photo yeah. of a black hole. I did not knew it was M87, that's amazing. Yeah, it's M87. So the next thing we wanna do is, this is just a still picture. We wanna take a video of this black hole and that's what they're working on in the community right now. This picture below again is M87 and this, see the strip, this trail right here? This is actually the light trying to escape from the black hole. If you had a 14 inch SCT, okay? Jeff, you wanna get a 14 inch one so you can take this picture. You would be able to take a very similar picture to this and actually capture the light trying to escape from the black hole. That is really crazy. I will, uh, what what I think I will do, I will have to, I will have to postpone that purchase. But can you help us understand, Jim, uh, when we saw the movie Interstellar, that kind of an, a picturization of the accretion disk and the way a black hole might be, uh, I think after we took the photos, after we, even the scientists took the photos, they could see it was, uh, there are plenty of uh, I would say similarities between the depiction, correct? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's what's what's really incredible is, you know, obviously astronomers are really intelligent and the theories they come up with and how they in black holes act or other things. I mean, uh, I'm, they're pretty close to the mark. Obviously, that's why we still explore in space. That's why we still send out Voyagers or satellites and uh, 
you know, do all this exploration in space to validate these theories. So one day we could actually be true, I guess, explorers and explore the universe. Absolutely. Um, this is my last space slide, this picture here. Uh, obviously, hopefully everybody watched Crew Dragon 1 launch over the weekend. Okay, that was Crew 1. Crew 2 are the astronauts. The only reason I have up here is because actually the commander, when I taught math at West Point, uh, he was actually my office mate. So this is Shane Kimbrough. He's a Army Lieutenant Colonel test pilot, or Colonel test pilot, and he'll be the commander of the next capsule. And that's going to be the pilot, Megan. Um, so, you know, kudos to them. And uh, good luck to the next crew that go up to space. Jim, so, you know some good people. <laughs> now, you pure luck. Good friends. <laughs> pure luck. What is it? Six Sigma or whatever. I, I slide with some final thoughts afterwards. So, uh, so First of all, Jim, that is really fascinating, absolutely fascinating, in sense. And there is so many things that are just bustling in my mind. Thank you for taking us on this really an, uh, an everlasting, a huge journey as such. We are, in, in the words of, I would say, Carl Sagan, we are on this pale blue dot. And I don't want to repeat the, the entire elements, but I think, at least in his words, when he starts the book, he says, in the, in the vastness of the space and the immensity of time. Thank you, Jim, for sharing, sharing your, uh, your narrative with us, uh, Mayor, Mayor Designers. I have many questions. I will try to be a little bit fast with them. Uh, it's, it's how, how did your love for this space began? Like, because it's, I know I'm also a budding astronomer, uh, uh, amateur astronomer, I would say, but how, how, did, you, how did you start? How were you exposed to this, this art? Yeah, that's a real question. Like I said, I've been in space. Uh, I haven't told very many people this, but when I was in the army, I actually applied to be an astronaut during the shuttle program. Yeah. Unfortunately, I wasn't accepted, and that's because I didn't have my PhD. They were looking for engineers with PhDs. So I'm convinced if I had my PhD, then I would have been on the program. But regardless, um, that was part of it. And then my son, so I have four boys. The two youngest are twins. One of them, I'm convinced, is going to be an astronaut one day. He's really into space. He can tell you everything about SpaceX, this program. He asked for a telescope once one Christmas. We got him a little telescope. And then it kind of went off from there because uh, we knew that Mercury was going to cross the sun. We want to be able to take that. So it was kind of one step at a time. And then as you look at these deep space objects, I'm telling you, whenever you take one of these pictures and you see it come up on your, your, like your iPad or your, uh, your computer, you're always in awe. Yeah. You're going, how the heck is that up there? Because when you look up there as an average person, you know, you're just, you know, and you appreciate nature, you kind of look at the stars, which are beautiful. You're looking at meteors crossing the sky. You look at the sun, you might see an eclipse or a, a whatever. Um, but the fact that you're able to capture that light coming from outer space beyond your own solar system, to me, is an incredible inspiration on just what's out there. And the designs of just this universe is unimaginable. And to be part of that and to capture that is kind of what we want to do. And I, I think uh, we, can, we need to have another, another uh, element on this to go from the definition of an universe now to the multi-universe, uh, the multiverse as such, which is a completely different uh, element. But but that kind of an element about we are there is so much elements over there and there's so much elements to learn from yeah. but coming back to your your art of photography first of all hats off to it by the way uh, the audience it's not easy to uh, it's it's not easy to these flying guys because that's a moving target but yeah. they're still 50 100 feet away from you or your targets are moving at light blazing speeds across the universe uh, the, the entire elements technology only can go beyond but i think there is an loads of patience and planning uh, to go uh, and get that kind of a composite image. So uh, I will try to be a little bit still, uh, we will go, we can go over maybe five minutes, Jonathan, I hope it's okay with you, but tell us about, like for me, 
to take one picture over there of that uh, blue wing uh, uh, warbler. You get up at three o'clock in the morning, you jump in the car, drive two hours, go in the forest area, walk inside for one hour, sit there till six o'clock to see one uh, bird, if at all it might come or not. There's lots of pre-planning, then the click happens, and then lots of post-processing also. Help us understand how intense it is getting the, your rig set up, going to the perfect spot, and, and, and getting this uh, photographs in that freezing nights in Arizona. <laughs> Now that's a great question, because I tell people that taking a picture on planet Earth is actually pretty simple, right? Yeah. Like you said, you know, you you throw your little camera in, you go to that spot, you got to make sure the lighting is right. You'll snap maybe a hundred pictures, uh, and you're going to pick out the best ones, do the post processing, and go to it. Now, if you do an HD image, you know, you might pick the best three different exposure levels. Because I've been there, right? So. Yeah. That scenario is not too bad. Well, try to multiply this as a 10x hard problem, right? You got to make sure you have the right mount that's tracking the sky. You've got to what's called polar align the mount. Remember those pictures you see of the sky where the stars are like in a circle? Yep. Yeah, we have the North Star, which doesn't move. So you're going to polar align your mount so it's looking exactly at the North Star so you're in perfect rotation with the planet. Okay, that's the first thing you have to do. And then you've got to make sure that mount is tracking properly and precisely. Okay, it, there can't be any error because if there's error in the mount, you're going to get blurry pictures, you're going to get star trails. Now the telescope if it's really cold, again, this is all taking place at night. And the funny thing is, I just recently spoke with some astronomy students. They're called vampires because they're up late at night and they're sleeping during the day. So they're all called vampires, right? Um, and I really feel like a vampire because my wife will kind of be annoyed if I'm up all night, especially two days in a row, because that's what you have to do. You get up, you're, you're basically working once the sun drops to to when it comes back up and it's really quiet, I really like it. And then, you know, the, besides aligning the mount, now you've got to attach the telescope. If it's really cold at night, you've got to have something that prevents dew from collecting on the lens. Because yeah. remember, I'm taking over 90, 100 pictures. The, the aperture is open for at least a minute to five minutes. So if I have dew collecting on the sensors, those pictures are useless, right? Yep. Um, I also have to deal with satellites cutting across the image, right? Um, I've got to make sure the camera is being cooled properly to absorb all those faint photons coming from space. Yep. I've got to make sure I've got the right filters on board because if I, if I take a picture in a light polluted area, I want to cancel out incandescent lighting any type of natural or not natural light, human made light that's coming into my telescope. So it's a myriad of problems that you have to cope with. I've got to cope with clouds coming across the, uh, the viewing area. I've got to make sure I'm at the right angle to get the target. But the big thing is staying on target long enough to take enough pictures. And that's just collecting the data. And then there's the post-processing. So it is a very difficult problem. It is, it is a very difficult and there's a huge amount of patience uh, that, that, that needs there and huge amount of manual tinkering rather than just letting the computer do its job. That's, that, that's fascinating. Literally, I'm going to, uh, there is uh, plenty of questions. There is one from Marcy Guth. Uh, I will just try to uh, ask the first part of it. She says, fascinating, literally. But how often are the nebulae, the nebulae portraits revisited considering organic changes? Say that one more time. I missed the last piece of that. Question. How often are nebulae portraits revisited considering organic changes? Oh, oh, oh sure. Um, I mean, they're revisited quite a few times because there's a lot of studies on how fast they're expanding. I think that's the question. Yeah. So, you know, once you take your first image, would you go back? Sure, absolutely. Because we noticed changes and events that are occurring in those nebulas because they're actually living creatures if you think about it. Things are changing. You could have new stars being born and we want to make sure we kind of understand the processes that are occurring. Absolutely. 
and 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 i i know there are so many questions uh, the typical ones about you you slightly mentioned about holy toledo imagining we are the only ones on this planet in this vastness of space and yeah. we can think about the the probability of having a life as we know it it might be a uh, intelligent life or it might be an alga algae or it might be just the uh, the microorganisms as such that can be a pretty different can of worms to open uh, there might be a couple of other questions i would just i was writing down uh, profusely the elements by the way there are plenty of names that are common with the bird photography and what you are doing yeah. uh, just the, the pelican uh, one the eagle one even the pelican uh, pelican being near the uh, I mean the Cygnus uh, constellation so it's, yeah. it's 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 pretty interesting do you do solar eclipse photography mom the the last yeah, one that's that's, that's a really hard one i've i've tried solar eclipse um you have to be on your money and on the game because it happens so fast so you kind of have to practice um i've done it not very good at it um but yeah it, it's it that's even that's a pretty hard problem as well that that is that is pretty hard Uh, I think uh, not everybody would have amazing rigs like you, especially the three ones that you mentioned. Uh, uh, but I think, can you just let people know you, if you still have a pair of glasses, a pair of uh, decent binoculars, you can still try to go and enhance your night journey in the sky. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. If you get a pair of decent binoculars, you can see some of those objects I described. Obviously, you'll need a telescope, definitely. And then you know the last thing is I leave you with these questions. And then I stole something from Jacqueline, which is really uh, appropriate for this talk. You know the reason for being, right? You know, are we the only ones here? Is there anything else beyond there, beyond the? You know, why are we here? Are we here to go explore the universe, right? And that's what Eli Musk would say, right? That's why we want to go to Mars. We want to go beyond our solar system. So these are some questions to contemplate and think about with deep thought, um, because you know every once in a while we're in our own bubble. We think we're the most important thing here, or this is just our space. But there is so much more out there, so much more. And the other piece I would leave you with is this picture from the Hubble telescope at the top. Oh, yeah. If you look at that picture, those are all galaxies, okay? And yeah. that is mind blowing. and that is just a little sliver of the space that he that scope is looking at okay awesome i i i like this kind of and questions you are throwing at the audience to for us to contemplate on and uh, especially going now in the holiday season we have a little bit more time to contemplate and think but like things like should we colonize other planets that's such an amazing question and it it talks about the the ethos uh, the reason of being means by the way that amazing connection back to jacqueline's element of the reason uh, of our primary existence uh, for survival on this planet what is on the other side that's that's so amazing questions why are we here are we concerned about an extinction event on earth and for 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 the folks means it's not just about i would say human species you are saying is about extinction and earth has been through around seven or eight kind of a near to extinction kind of an yeah. element too and every time uh, human beings were not there but life still rebounded so uh, there is there is an another mechanism here where earth is still taking care of its uh, flora and fauna humans being just just a part of them uh, i think i think we should uh, we should try to uh, try to uh, close this up uh, so thank you once again jim and oh, yeah. we, hope we can bring you once again next year on this and we can talk about the multi universe and the philosophical elements of of the magnanimity uh, of where we are but thank you again i am yeah, happy guys yeah, this week is going to be exciting and one day i maybe the last question do you do you do this as a team sport when you as uh, astronomers go and photograph because in the birder community since it is so early dark here and there we go literally anywhere in the jungles we try to make sure we are at least three or four people so somebody we do absolutely up. yeah there are night sky events where a bunch of young uh, you know uh, amateur astronomers were come together to a location and and just shoot all night yep absolutely Awesome. Thank okay. you again. Thank you, Thank you again. Thank you. And and be on, but just uh, mute yourself. Yeah, uh, unvideo yourself, and uh, I will try to get our uh, next speaker who is really patiently waiting uh, on on the backstage. But again, uh, for the for the audience, it is a fascinating thing to just understand uh, the context of where you are. Right. When we look at even in the design world, when when Charles and Eames went with the 
uh, with the factors of 10, like you zoom in and zoom out, those kind of an elements to how much to zoom out, uh, literally as a design a designer or, or a or forward thinker like you, how much to zoom out uh, to, to the fence, go to the fence and again coming back. That kind of an, I would say, uh, the pulsation really, really helps to understand the granularity of where we are on this earth and the vastness of the vision of where 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 it has to go or where it can go. I will try to, uh, since uh, Jim invoked Carl Sagan, I should, it would be remiss if I don't at least try to uh, get a quote from him uh, to uh, to wrap up uh, this section. I, I will try to paraphrase uh, from, from Carl Sagan, but he says like to him, he would be only a boy playing on a seashore, diverting himself, perhaps picking up an, uh, a seashell or a shiny, uh, I would say, a pebble from the shore, which is just a little bit more shinier and better than the ordinary, while the great ocean of the vastness is still undiscovered and lay uh, in front of him. And that's where we are. When I say we, I think the human species, we are industrial revolution, only 200 years young, right? 250 maximum. There's so much we have seen and discovered and invented and trying to go to the beyond world. And I think there is this amazing things to be sensed uh, as, as we are being placed in this entire, entire element. 